Welcome to this edition of the 802.11 Commentary Series. My name is Tom Carpenter and I'm the CTO with CWNP. Today we're going to be focusing on Clause 4.2, how wireless LAN systems are different. Before we talk about the uniqueness of 802.11 wireless LANs, let me introduce you to the CWNP certifications. The certifications can take you from a wireless LAN novice to a recognized industry expert. It all begins with the CWTS certification. This specialist level is a great introduction for those new to the study of wireless LANs and 802.11 based technologies. It's also good for project managers and technical sales professionals, among others. The next level is the CWNA. The Certified Wireless Network Administrator is an individual who has proven knowledge in RF behavior, planning, implementation, security, and support. This is a required certification for those desiring to achieve more focused and elite certifications later on. The next level is the professional level and includes the design, security, and analysis professionals. Here you learn the details related to planning, securing, and analyzing or troubleshooting a wireless LAN. Each of these certifications takes the knowledge of the CWNA certification to a deeper level still. After achieving the CWNA and all three professional level certifications and proving industry experience and knowledge, you can qualify for the expert level with the CWNE certification. This level ensures both advanced knowledge and experience in working with 802.11 wireless LAN technology. You can always learn more about the certifications and also prepare for them at CWNP.com, the company website, which includes blogs, forums, and resources to help you succeed in this industry. Now we're going to begin by looking at Clause 4.2 in an overview. First of all, it is focused on the uniqueness of wireless LANs. And this focus drills down into wireless stations, the impact of the media that is utilized for wireless communications, handling mobile stations, interaction with other 802 layers, and interaction with non-802 protocols. And stated in 4.2.1 is, wireless networks have fundamental characteristics that make them significantly different from traditional wired local area networks. So this is what we're focusing on in this edition of the 802.11 commentary. The differences or the uniqueness of 802.11 wireless LANs. Let's begin by looking at 4.2.2, the focus on wireless stations as opposed to wired stations. When it comes to wired network devices, it is assumed that an address is equivalent to a physical location. For example, a computer is plugged into a CAT5 or a CAT6 cable. That computer can only go within the range of that cable, and in most cases, it means it's at a fixed location. In wireless networks, this is not necessarily the case. Because that wireless device can move around, there is no tethered cable, it could move from one access point to another access point, or even pass among several dozen access points in some environments, depending on how it's utilized. So the wireless station may be a fixed device that is fixed to a location, but it may also be a portable device, such as a tablet today, or simply a wireless phone. It could be a laptop that is mobile as well. So we could have a portable device, we could have a mobile device, we could have quality of service stations. These are wireless clients that implement specifically quality of service capabilities. The main point is to understand that a wireless station is very different than a wired station. And we have to consider this when implementing and planning wireless LANs. The next thing to consider is the media impact on the design and performance of a wireless network. There are several items that the 802.11 2012 standard specifies as fundamentally different from wired media. We can say that there are neither absolute nor observable boundaries outside which stations with conformant phi transceivers are known to be unable to receive network frames. In other words, a client device may be completely compatible with 802.11 but unable to communicate with the network because it is beyond the range of that network. And this range is not a fixed boundary. We can't measure out from the antenna at 50 feet and say, okay, that's where the network stops. Maybe it is where good connections stop today, but maybe tomorrow or even in five minutes, the connection goes out another six feet or goes closer to the antenna by another six feet. The point is that it is a dynamic environment. It changes based on changes in the environment. Also, 
the wireless signals are unprotected from other signals in the environment. The wireless signals go through or propagate through free space and other signals are in that same free space and they could interfere upon your network. They communicate over a medium that's less reliable than a wired PHY. Wired PHYs have the luxury of saying the cable's plugged in at both ends, it's a good cable, it is the proper length or shorter, and therefore we're good to go. With a wireless network, things are very different. We have many dynamic things, and hence the statement that we have dynamic topologies. This simply means that the topology can change dynamically over time. Now we have two different types of topologies in general within 802.11. We have the traditional basic service set, which is more of the enterprise implementation of wireless LANs. In this case, we have at least one access point. Clients all connect to the access point and communicate through it. But we also have the ad hoc wireless LANs or the independent basic service sets. In this case, there's a lot of dynamic capabilities there that it can be built on the fly. But even with the infrastructure basic service set, we have some dynamic elements to that in that a client may be connected to one access point at one moment, and then it may move a few feet and connect to another access point, completely changing the communication path that that device is going through to get to some remote technology. So therefore, there's a dynamic topology. In addition to that, we may lack full connectivity. In other words, every device may not be able to see or communicate with every other device. If you think of a hub in a traditional wired network, every device on that hub, barring things like access control lists or other filters, can communicate with every other device on that hub. It's not necessarily true if you think of the AP as a hub that every device can communicate with every other device or that they can even see or hear every other device. We have this issue of the hidden node where one device can see the AP, another device can see the AP, but the two devices or stations cannot see each other. We also have the issue of time varying and asymmetric propagation properties. So the way in which signals propagate in the RF medium or in the wireless LAN is going to vary over time. It's going to be different in different directions and we have to consider that. We also may experience interference from logically disjoint 802.11 networks that are in either overlapping areas or possibly that are adjacent to our network channels. But the point is that we're going to have issues with networks that are either not part of our network or they're part of our network but a different network that we also manage and they can cause interference with one another. So these are all issues that we have to consider related to the very media that we use in order to communicate on the 802.11 wireless network. Next we need to consider the impact of handling mobile stations. Now remember we have mobile stations and we have portable stations. A portable station is one that's moved from location to location, but it's used only while it's at a fixed location. Think of a laptop. You use it in your office, you close the lid, you walk down the hallway to a conference room, open the lid, and then you use it again. The mobile station is actually the one that uses the network while you're moving around. For example, a voice over Wi-Fi phone. The issue that we need to keep in mind is that we can't treat our clients as portable stations, even if they are only portable stations. In other words, maybe you're not using voice over Wi-Fi. Maybe you're not allowing for tablets and other such things as this. So you don't have any true mobile stations. The issue you have to keep in mind is because of propagation effects, variance over time, things moving around in the environment and so forth. You have to treat even your portable stations as mobile stations. In other words, you have to make sure you have sufficient coverage so that if things change slightly in the environment, that coverage is not lost. So these are important things to consider with mobile stations, whether they are truly mobile or just portable. Now the other thing we have to think about is how that 802.11 interacts with other 802 technologies. One of the most important 802 technologies that we use for security today is 802.1x 2004. So 802.1x gives you port-based authentication. This is the one that gives you the controlled and the uncontrolled port. It allows you to use different EAP or extensible authentication protocol types in order to authenticate your users. So obviously it's very, very important that we understand there is interaction between 802.11 and other 802 technologies like 802.1x. In addition, we have some things that we implement at the Mac layer of 802.11 that may not be there in wired technologies due to the nature of 802.11. That is, we need some specific quality of service capabilities built into 802.11, and thankfully they have been added in recent years. 
Now, finally, we have to think about the fact that 802.11 interacts with other non-802 protocols. In other words, even non-IEEE protocols, such as the Internet Engineering Task Force. And this ranges from things like taking advantage of the RADIUS specifications and goes all the way to things like how we structure characters with Unicode characters and things like that. Throughout the standard, you will see references that work in a couple of ways. One way is it says some examples of what we mean are specific RFCs. And another way is that it says it must be implemented according to a specific RFC. So watch for that language. When it says it has to be implemented according to a specific IETF RFC, then that means that you're going to have to do it the way the RFC says. And then there are other times when it says there are examples, and these examples are certain RFCs. That means it's open, and you can implement it in the way that you desire or need to, but these RFCs are just examples or samples of how it could be implemented. And this is where it ends up being left up to vendors in many cases as to how they actually implement these various technologies. Many of the things that we learn about when we're studying the 802.11 standard are designed the way they are because of the media that is used. The RF communication signals and the way that they behave, the way they function, all of these things dictate that certain things had to be added to the 802.11 standard, which make it in some cases more complex than the 802.3 standard, for example, which is the Ethernet standard. Thank you for viewing this edition of the 802.11 Commentary.